stars beyond our galaxy. Good morning and welcome once again to Quail Hollow's online worship service. We're glad you decided to join us today. We hope that our service will speak to you in some way that you can carry a word or a phrase with you throughout the week. Now, please join us for holy worship. Thank you once again for joining us and now let's pray together. Ever present God, you never leave us. Help us to stay with you when we are tempted to flee and keep us seeking after that which is true, that all may know that you are the Lord our God, always present in whatever our reality. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. call to worship. Rejoice with me, people of God. God has gathered us in from the wilderness. Rejoice with me, people of God. God has swept away the darkness of the night. Rejoice with me, people of God. Today there's joy in the presence of the angels. A prayer of confession. We have sinned in the eyes of our Lord, so let us come before the throne of God the mercy seat with all of our humanity, open to the peace of promised forgiveness, always trusting in God's grace as we confess our sins saying, let us pray together. 
You invite us to your feast, O God, and we do not come. You beg us to give thanks for life, and we fail in your thanksgiving. You have made for us a wonderful earth, and we neglect the gift. Forgive us for what we have done and for abandoning the pathway you desire for us. Be our guide and conscience. Turn our feet and hands to your will, that all we do might give glory to you. And now let us continue our prayers in silent and personal confession. Amen. A declaration of forgiveness. The God of peace, who calls all creation to live in unity, hears your plea. In the spirit of feasting and thanksgiving, in the mercy of Almighty God, we are forgiven. For the sake of Christ Jesus, our Savior, who died and rose from the dead to destroy the shroud of death, rejoice. God's peace is from everlasting to everlasting. Through Christ, God's peace becomes our gift to one another. Let us offer that gift to one another. The peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. May, May the, the peace, peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. The peace, the peace of the, of the Lord, Lord be, be with, with you, you. <laughs> and also with you, and also with you, and, and also with, with you. you, and also with you. Good morning. We are happy to report that we have formed a committee that is, is assigned with the task of discerning the past, current, and future state of our congregation. While we undergo the transition to a new pastor, receiving objective feedback from our congregation is an important part of the transition. In the weeks ahead, we will be reaching out to our membership to try to gain perspective on where God is leading our congregation. Through the guidance of Reverend Hoving, this process will unfold in the form of surveys, conversations, and small groups. Once our work is complete, we will share our information with the session. The session will then give direction to the pastor nominating committee as they look to find a new pastor. The work of the transition committee with valuable input from the congregation is critical for us to understand our path forward. The PNC will then search for a minister with the skill set to help us navigate that path. You will be hearing from us, and we welcome and need your valuable perspective. We will also be reporting progress to the congregation on a regular basis so you can understand where we are in the overall process. Pray for us and our congregation as all work together to glorify God and help solidify his ministry at Quail Hollow Presbyterian Church. 
Good morning. My name is Stephanie Burns, and today I'm here to talk with you about Operation Christmas Child. For those of you that are new to this project, Operation Christmas Child is a mission we have participated in as a church for a number of years. It's coordinated through Samaritan's Purse, and it endeavors to send a box filled with hygiene items, small gifts, and school supplies to needy children throughout the world, along with a message of Christ's love for them. It goes without saying that this year has been a strange one, and so it is with Operation Christmas Child. Many of you have asked if we were even going to be able to do shoeboxes this year, and the answer is yes. But will it be different? Yes, too. One of the differences is that we don't have wrapped boxes for you this year, as we have done for so many years. The Tuesday night women's group has been unable to meet. You are welcome to wrap your own, and in fact, we even have some boxes that need wrapping out in the narthex. We also have pre-printed boxes like this, that are both assembled and not assembled, and you can use. The ones already folded have been done so with gloves. Inside, there is a brochure that tells you all the do's and don'ts. Fold it out, open it, look at it. And on the back, and this is important, are labels. It's important that you use these labels because they help track the box. You can also download labels online if you would like to do that. And you have to attach them to the outside. We have not been good at doing that in years past, but it's going to prevent people from having to root through your box if it's inside to label the box. So please take a minute, cut the label out, and stick it on the front. Collection week is Sunday, November 15th through the 23rd. We won't have a blessing like we have done in years past during our service this year, but you can return the boxes to the church and the Tuesday night women's group will be glad to get them to the distribution center. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me or call the church office. As always, we thank you for your participation, but we understand if you don't feel you can get out to shop or fill your box this year. If you would rather donate items or write a check to support this work, we will be glad to fill a box for you. This has been a difficult year for so many, and yet we know it's been even harder for those that have so little. So whatever you can do, know that it will be appreciated. And you will have done your part to spread the love of Jesus Christ to many who need it more than ever. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gail Bonnell, and I will be chairing the Stewardship 2021 for Quail Hollow Church. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes and talk about giving and tithing. There's a Bible verse that has been um, something that has inspired me for many, many years. It's Luke 12, 48, and it goes like this. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I love this verse because I think it really lays down the expectations that God has for us in our blessings. When we are blessed, the expectations are you give back. Uh, this has been a very difficult year for everyone, and we certainly, I certainly understand that. And yet, at the same time, for our church to continue on to be the church of Jesus Christ, it's, in, it's imperative that everyone think about their giving, their tithing, and their time to the church. A few days ago, as I was thinking about the upcoming year and the upcoming year for the church, I started thinking about specific members in our church who inspire me. And they inspire me not only because of their financial support of the church, but because of their time and the energy and all that they put into the missions of our church. And I, and I, and I felt overwhelmed with emotion with how wonderful these people are to our congregation and to those in need and, to, and, and they see something and they step up and they do it. So what I'd ask of each person, as you think about stewardship and what your contribution is to the church, to the church of Jesus Christ, that you spend a few minutes and some time giving prayer, prayerful consideration to, to your tithe, 
to your time and to what you're putting back into the church. Because the reality is we need everyone to be a part of the giving of our church. Thanks so much. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you've had a good week. We've had another wonderful week of fall weather. <laughs> Got a little warmer, but it's been nice to have this fall weather. Well, last week, Miss Cindy told you a story about the black cat and how God created us all as we're supposed to be. We are how he wants us to be, and he's made us human. Well, today's story, it kind of follows along with the idea that God made us all human. The story was from the book of Philippians, and Paul wrote a letter to these people. And he wrote letters to the early churches to help them understand how they were supposed to teach about Jesus and what the church should be. And he was encouraging them. And he was saying, we're going to have bad thoughts because we're human. Things pop into our head. Because we're human, sometimes we can't control these thoughts. But when we have them, as soon as we have them, we should try to change our thoughts to what Jesus would want us to do or how he would want us to think. And he said, told the people, you need to be role models. Now you might be saying, okay, what's a role model? <laughs> well, you have role models in your life. You have people like your parents and your teachers that are showing you how you should live your life and how you should act and what you should do. These people are role models. There's some sports figures that are doing wonderful things with charities, and these people are role models. So today, <laughs> I'm going to be teaching about role models. So I brought a role. Yes, this is a role. And well, this is a model of a role. <laughs> so because we're human and because thoughts come into our head, we have to practice when those thoughts come in our head to think a different way, to don't let those thoughts control us because he wants us to all be one church and one people that believe in him. So, ooh, sometimes we do have thoughts of hate that you get so mad and you'll just think, oh, I hate that person, or I hate what they're making me do, or I hate doing this, or I hate Brussels sprouts. Well, I hate that too, but that's not a bad thought. So we want to get rid of that hate thought. We want to think good thoughts. We want to, instead of saying, I hate that he made a better grade than me, you might want to say, well, I am so happy for them and I love the, that they were able to do better than me and next time I'll do better. And jealous. I know I've had this feeling <laughs> growing up, especially I'd be jealous of my best friend because they had a big house and she always had nice clothes and you know, sometimes I'd feel jealous of all this. But God doesn't want us to be jealous. He wants us to be have gratitude, be grateful what we do have, and be happy for those people for what they have. And try not to be, you know, the, the thought will jump in your head and like, oh, I wish I had that. But then he says, okay, change your thought to saying, well, I'm really glad for what I do have. Worry. Oh, right now, in this time, with all that's going on, a lot of worry. But when you worry, it's like saying, God, I don't think you know what you're doing and you're not in control and I'm going to sit here and worry about it. Well, worry isn't changing anything. You can pray and hope things are different. So when worry thoughts come into your head, you need to get rid of those worry thoughts and use your faith and find peace because that's what God wants us to have. So use your faith and say, I know these things are, might be bad, but he's in control and it will change. And I just have to sit and wait for how it's gonna be. So the next one, this is the last one, is mean thoughts. And we have, this happens, I, I, everybody does it. And you, uh, someone does better than you or your parents won't let you do what you wanna do. You have mean thoughts about them. Well, they're not going to help you. God wants us to be happy. And if you're having mean thoughts, you're not being happy. So get rid of your mean thoughts and be nice. Think nice thoughts because you can't be happy if you're worrying 
or you're being anxious or mean that other people are having mean thoughts. So think nice thoughts because that will make you happy. So that's the end of my role models. <laughs> so we are to be examples to other people. And that's what Paul told the people in Philippi. You show all the other people, because this is the beginning of the church where there weren't little, any other Christians around. They were all different religions. And he said, show them how you're, that a Christian acts. Be an example, a role, a role model for these other people. And we're all going to go to heaven together at the, at the end of the day when everybody, you know, we all end up in heaven. So why not get along with each other on earth? Because we're going to be in heaven together. So let's start here on earth to be nice to each other. And there's two things that he said that I thought were so important that I actually wrote them down so that I could read them to you. Because these are, I love these two things that were in that book. The first one was that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. He keeps us in that straight road so that he will guard our hearts against mean feelings and our minds against bad thoughts. And the next one was rejoice in the Lord. He repeated himself in that rejoice in the Lord. And be so if we can do these things, and we know that God is there with us, guarding our hearts and our minds, and that we rejoice in the Lord. Then it'll help us to become the people that God wants us to be. So let's pray about this. Dear Heavenly Father, you made us human. We have thoughts and we have feelings that sometimes aren't good. Thank you for guarding our hearts and minds so that we can be examples for others so they will know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. prayer for illumination. 
Your word, O God, is a feast all its own. Let your Holy Spirit open our minds to your call to listen, for we know your holy word heals and reconciles your people. An Old Testament reading from Psalm 106. Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or declare all his praise? Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory in your heritage. Both we and your ancestors have sinned. We have committed inequity, have done wickedly. They made a calf at Horeb and worshiped at a cast image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God their savior who had done great things in Egypt. Wondrous works in the land of Ham and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen one stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Our second reading this morning is taken from the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses one through nine. This is also our sermon text today. Listen again to the word of the Lord for us. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yeodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companions, help these women since they have contended to my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let us pray. Holy Spirit, shine your light upon your word proclaimed and into our hearts that we may be enlightened with fresh understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. My call in the ministry actually began when I was still working for Freightliner Corporation. We had moved to Concord and I had become active in a small local church. The more I supported and worked in the church, the deeper my faith grew and the more I felt connected and part of something. It was at that time that I felt once again that something was missing, something was calling me, encouraging me to do more. At that point, I began asking questions of pastors that I had met along the way, all wanting them to say to me, yes, Brian, you've been called into ministry. <laughs> well, that's not what happened. However, through prayer, more questions, lots of questions, studying scripture and more reflection, I responded to the call and have not looked back once. Now, has this journey been easy? Have I experienced sleepless nights, headaches, hurt, 
questions about what I'm doing? Yes. While I was in seminary, I had one set of questions. But when I entered parish ministry, another set of questions emerged, some very difficult. But my call to ministry has offered me the opportunity to be associated with many amazing people, many of which are in this congregation and others whom I've served in different churches. I have been welcomed into many homes where I've been told stories about their families, how they came into the community and how they serve that community, and of course, their family history in the church. I've also heard stories about the Joneses, the Lockleers, the Smiths, and many other families in the church. Stories I probably should not have been told. I've also experienced many joys in ministry. For instance, when I get ready to, to share the word with you, I ask the Holy Spirit to be upon me and to turn my words into a meaningful message. When I work with families before a baptism, and then I watch the different reactions of the baby when I perform the actual baptism. And then when I'm serving Holy Communion, and I look at the faces of the congregation, and I see those faces who hunger and thirst to experience the Lord's presence through this holy meal. And then, of course, there is the joy of marriage. It's great fun to sit with couples who have gone through the court, courtship phase of their relationship and now are ready to further cement their feelings through marriage. They share with me the best of times, how wonderful it was when they first met. Pastor, it was love at first sight. How their relationship has grown stronger and stronger and never has there been a cross word between them. It's wonderful to hear young couples talk about their relationship and their future plans. But then I must push them, remind them of reality. I have to be up front and tell them that one day, no matter how deeply in love they are with one another, they will discover that their partner just happens to be a human being. And when that happens, they will discover that he or she is annoying and consistently imperfect. I believe that if we're honest with ourselves, we could say the same thing about any significant relationship. And friends, sooner or later, this is going to happen to us. We will become disenchanted. The habits we once ignored now test our patience. And we stand back and say, who is that person? At that point, we are confronted with a choice. Do we stay in that relationship and do the hard work to regain what we have lost? Or do we simply look elsewhere? The truth is, friends, the church is no exception to this human behavior. As we all know, the church is full of people, full of human beings. Tom Boskett said when he wrote this about Jesus, where two or three are gathered in my name, someone's feelings are going to get hurt. Now we know Jesus didn't say that, but he could have because who knew people better than Jesus? But let's take a minute and look at a little history of the disciples and how they didn't always get along. Remember James and John asking for a special seat in heaven and how that irritated the others? And then what about Judas and his actions against Jesus and his brothers? There was Levi, the tax collector, and Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe unless. Friends, there was conflict. There was disenchantment. There was impatience with one another. Why? Because they were human beings. Now, let's consider some of Paul's letters to the other churches that he wrote. 
Each letter he wrote addressed the community church, and each letter was an intervention. His letter to the Galatians dealt with their relationship on membership requirements. For the Corinthians, the letter was concerned about the communion. The Colossians, it was an issue of, of diversity. And to the Philippians, it was a disagreement between two women leaders of the church. These two leaders, Euodia and Syntyche, were at odds with one another, and the people were taking sides. Tempers were rising, and it did not look good for the church. It must have been heated for Paul to hear about this in his jail cell in Rome. So he writes, I urge Euodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Dr. Tom Boskett wrote this concerning the two women, quote, whatever differences you may have, don't let that be one of them. For if it is, then all is lost. His point is that you can disagree on many things, but just be of the same mind in the Lord. Agree on Jesus, end quote. Now, in Paul's letter, he reminds everyone to be of the same mind and to help these women. And by doing so, they are helping themselves to strengthen the community, helping them resolve their differences, if they can, builds unity in that community. And if they can't help them patch up their differences, well, it isn't the end, but it is a new beginning. As hard and difficult and hurtful as this may sound, one now has the opportunity to study themselves, to stop worrying about what they had, and to focus on finding the right place for worship. One that suits their needs and speaks to them. Finding that compatibility in marriage, in friendship, and yes, in church is accomplished only through love and doing the hard work of self-reflection. Now, finding that church that feels the way you do and agrees with you does not exist. Just ask Yodia and Syntyche. The church that best suits any of us is the one that is good at disagreements. It doesn't mean it will always agree, but it will tolerate differences with generosity. Friends, there is no perfect marriage, nor is there a perfect church. But that does not mean we stop searching, always trusting in God's love and guidance, because both will be needed. Paul wants the women to settle their disputes, and he calls to the community for help. It doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong, because they are both wrong. They're wrong in how they are treating each other, and wrong because of their actions. Their behavior is wrong for the church. And when it's wrong for the church, feelings are hurt. I love what a French expressionist wrote, quote, hell is other people, end quote. Ever feel that way? Of course we have, especially when we are trying to convince someone that they are wrong and we are right. Look at how divided our country is today. You can't open a newspaper or turn on the news not to see or hear a claim that this group did that and that group did this. The truth in resolution to a problem is that it's hard and messy, and it takes all parties willing to work together. It takes love, it takes patience. Christians know this better than anyone because there was nothing harder or messier than the cross. 
but also nothing more loving. Look, whenever groups of people are involved in working as a community, there will most likely be differences, which could lead to conflict. That is reality, and we sinful humans cannot stop that. We've seen our share of Yodias and Syntheses, and if we're honest, we may have been them. However, there is nothing like the church, for the church is a true blessing to many. After all I've said about conflict, how can I possibly say church is a blessing? It is because God is in it. How many times have we seen the church come together as one, surrounding a member of the family with love and affection and compassion? And what about the times that we've worked together with room at the end, sandwiches for urban ministry, collecting food for the community around the church, supporting various ministries with our financial gifts, and now our drive-by meal. You see, even in our differences, even when some differences cannot be resolved, the church is good because God is in it. It's good because we respond to God's call to serve our neighbors in need, to seek information about a member in their family, to pray for one another. Yes, friends, the church is a blessing. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us all agree on Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us say what we believe by affirming our faith and saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born under Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Friends, let us now calm our souls and open our hearts as we prepare to pray to God. So let us pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for bringing us safely into the sanctuary for holy worship. We understand, Lord, that not everyone feels comfortable returning, and we all respect that. And we hope that our service online is meaningful and will speak to those who prefer to stay home. We have been gone from this space for what feels like for years. And today, we are so thankful to be worshiping and praising you inside your church. Many people, Lord God, have worked hard to do everything they could to ensure the safety of your people. And yes, Lord, some of what is required may be uncomfortable, but we ask for your guiding hand, for your spirit will be upon them and give them peace as we all learn new ways to give you all glory and honor. These new ways of worship are required because the coronavirus has taken over 210,000 lives. So again, we ask for patience and understanding that only you can give. Settle us, Lord God, as we gather as your children in these uncertain times. Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know our every thought before we think it. You know our every action before they happen. And Lord, you know our sinful nature. 
Guide us, Lord, back on the pathway of eternal life, the one you had shown us, the one you invited us to follow. Forgive us, Lord, as we have turned away to make our own path away from you. Your love for us is beyond all human understanding, and your grace for us defies all our intellect. Give us peace of mind, soul, and heart as we graciously accept all you offer to us. Enlighten us in your will and your ways, and remind us, Lord God, that the path you have shown us is the path of hope, joy, and love. It is the path of righteousness. Lord, we continue to pray for those who have requested prayers. And we pray for those whom we do not know, but are suffering. As we gather in this space, let us lift up the church universal, the local church, and the home church. As we all share one thing in common, we all agree on Jesus. Lord, we pray for the families who have lost loved ones due to COVID. And we hope, Lord, that their hurt and pain eases and does not turn against you. We pray for all those who are working on treatments and cures from this virus. And of course, Lord, we pray for all those who have been infected. Let us be conscious on how we treat others how we treat Mother Earth, and how we respond to your word. And now, Lord, let us be calm in our spirits as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. As we say as one, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, since we are not passing the offering plates because they have been identified as a positive COVID spreader, we ask that you participate in this ministry, if you choose, by giving online and or by sending a check to the church office or by dropping one off. And we certainly do appreciate your gracious gift, and we know that God will take those gifts and multiply them. And now let us pray over this offering. Creator God, you are our provider. We offer all that, that we have and all that we are to you because we belong to you. Bless these gifts and empower us, your church, through the work of your spirit, that we may be a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and shade from the heat. Through Christ Jesus, our shield and our stronghold, we pray. Amen.
friends, we hope that our worship service spoke to you today and that you were able to take a word or a phrase with you and carry with you this week. And we hope that you will join us again on another worship service online and maybe even in person when you feel comfortable. Now, just know that the Lord loves us and the Lord keeps us. And the Lord is our shade at our right hand. And even when we experience in conflict within the church or with one another, God is there. And remember, we all agree on Jesus. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.